Panthers of the minor prims. Oh, wonky ball. Crichton. Crichton motoring away. They're not going to catch the Panthers number four. And Penrith pouts on a South Sydney mistake. Crichton with another try against the Bunnies. Oh, Coruscant skips out and goes to Martin. He scores the try. Yes, Liam. Coruscant. I fool them all. They've got the minor premiership wrapped up, but the big prize is still to come. Can they defend their title? Well, that remains to be seen, does it not? Brian Fletcher joining us. Okay, so 2020, COVID year. Played 20, won 18, drew one, lost one. 2021, a minor, minor premise that year, Penrith. 2021, played 24, won 21, lost three. Equal on points with the Melbourne Storm. Points differential meant they're in second place. No minor premiership. This year, 2022, played 22 games. So two left to play. They have already won 19 and lost three. cock a doodle do. That's such an amazing record. Brian Fletcher, congratulations. Penrith CEO joins us. G'day. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, it's been a great achievement by the boys and the coaching staff and so forth. And uh, they were over the moon last night just to see you and now get on with the job of playing finals football in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, look, I was fascinated to um, see Ivan in an interview a few weeks back where um, uh, it was, oh, it might have even been last week, it was the match against the Melbourne Storm. The chance to clinch didn't actually do it, but he was saying that he believes that more credit, more credence needs to be given to winning this minor premiership because if you look at, say, the parallel and I don't have to explain it to you, but say the English Premier League, you know, you go through 24 games, you win the round robin. That's a hell of an achievement. It says you're the best team. Yeah, that's right. Like the minor premiership uh, in the NRL competition, it's sort of like we'll celebrate it uh, next week against the Warriors. Uh, the shield will be presented, but then it sort of dies away and, and everybody forgets about it. And it's, it's all about winning the with the premiership then, but it doesn't get the, the credit it deserves out in the in the newspapers or the media. No, it doesn't get the recognition. Do you win any? Do you get any cash from it, or do you at least get a prize other than just a trophy? Well, it's a funny thing, Martin. We, we uh, they've cut the prize money in half. It's pre COVID. Uh, when COVID came in 19, they cut all the prize money for finals and minor premiership by 50%. Oh. And uh, Andrew Abde hasn't got around to readjusting that yet. So it was 200000 but we only get 100000 for that great achievement. Like, it's not a great deal of money. And what, what does that go? Does that go to the club or do the players enjoy that? How does that get divvied? The, the minor premiership goes to the, to, the, to the football department to run the, the organisation and... Um, and then there's a certain part of the prize money if they go any further that sort of is talked about with the players. Look, I'd like to see it recognised more because I, I know that, you know, we, we kind of get obsessed here with the kind of with 30 second attention span. And, you know, the finals is fantastic. It's a great series, but that's kind of like the FA Cup competition on top of the Premier League, isn't it? Yeah, basically, the, the, I've always said with the prize money, like you, you win a Melbourne Cup and you get $6 million. Mm. Like, you've got to. Like this goes for like half the year, and if you win the premiership this year, you get two hundred thousand dollars, and it's got to be you know there's thirty players involved in that. Like it, it probably should be three or four million dollars to win that. I don't know what the prize money is is in the FA Cup and all that sort of stuff, but um, it, to me, it's it's nowhere near what it should be. Brian Fletcher is the CEO of the Penrith Panthers and last night clinching it against the Rabbitohs. Look at your record there over the last three years, mate. 20 wins, 24, 22 so far. It's been an extraordinary level of consistency and achievement. It has been, Martin. And, and consider like how we've uh, done that as well with all the injuries we had. Like last year, we had seven players played in the final series. If it was a, just the normal round of competition, they wouldn't have played, they were that badly injured. Like Nathan played with a broken shoulder. And so to, to win that premiership, and we come last night against South Sydney, who never had a player out. And uh, we had our two star players, the Nathan Clear and Jerome Luai out. Our, one of the greatest forwards ever, Fisher Harris, out. And we had a late withdrawal of our bench with Scott Sorensen. And to be able to win under those circumstances was outstanding. Brian, you've been, you know, credited as the man responsible for bringing Ivan back to the club. First and foremost, is that actually true? I hope it's true. I've just said it's true. Um, yeah. My, uh, my, my chairman then was Dave O'Neill. He, he made the suggestion to the board uh, that we bring Ivan back. 
and uh, the board agreed to that. And then Dave said to me, "Now you go and talk to Ivan and see if you can get him over the line, and um, and see if you'll come back to uh, Pampers." And that wasn't a hard job. Uh, and that, uh, Ivan was excited to come back and coach his son. And plus, Ivan knew of all the talent was there because he was there a couple of years earlier and, and developing those young players. So he came back to finish a job that he started. And and what a heck of a performance he's put in in the last three years. No, I look, I, undoubted. I mean, we're still sick here at the Warrior. You know, Warriors country in New Zealand that we let him go. It was so bloody stupid of us. Why did you want him so bad, mate? Well, I, I think you're always looking for a quality person as well. And uh, Ivan's been that all his life. And, uh, and you know, it sort of helped us secure... Uh, Nathan long term as well like uh, right. I've just completed the deal with Ivan and, and Nathan to uh, 2027 so you know you've got to look to the future and, and secure it and um, we had no hesitation in extending them to long term deals. Mm, heck no. No, look, I mean, you know, real, really good family, really well-raised boy. I keep saying that to Ivan. I always look at the parents, mate, and congratulate the parents first. Uh, you know, I, I know he's, he's off at the moment, but look, he's such a good kid. And, oh, I call him a kid. God, he's 21. You've improved so much, though, Brian, over the last few years, uh, both on and off the field. What have you put in place to make the team so consistent and competitive, even when your best players are injured? And I'm asking this question on behalf of Warriors fans, because that's what we're desperate to get, that kind of level of consistency. Yeah. I think that the whole thing about it all, Ivan's always believed that if we get the culture right on the field and off the field, we'll be successful. Now, we had to let some players go and uh, we had to change some things off the field. Uh, we've done all that and it, I'm sure he's very comfortable with the culture he's got. And bringing players to the club, the first thing that's got to be right and we've got to do is our due diligence on it is the culture of the person and um, that that's that's in a nutshell it's getting the culture right on the field and off the field so we call that in New Zealand or the All Blacks have called it a no dickheads policy I don't know whether you sort of describe it as the same thing but essentially is that what you're saying the person's got to be the right person exactly yeah yeah but you know you can't come to our place with a big ego because you, you won't fit into the system you know, it's a team. It's not a one person. It's not me or you or whatever. It's, it's all a team culture. And uh, Nathan's very good at that. Like, he's probably the best player in the world, but he's he's part of a team. And he doesn't go out and say, it's, it's me. It's a team all the time. And um, you've only got to see them train when they're at training or, or when you go over there myself. Like, I'm the group CEO as well and run five clubs as well as... Uh, was running the football now. Matt Cameron stepped up to do that. But you go over there, like they'll all pull up and shake your hand and say, "How are you, Brian?" And Brilliant. so forth. And uh, it doesn't matter who you take over there as well. They'll always acknowledge the people and pull up and and talk to them. And they'll sign any garment for you, hat or whatever. But when and nothing's a problem. And uh, I, I think that's that's the secret to it all. You know, you've got to get that right. And that's probably got to start in our top office with our chairman and directors as well, which it has done over the last four or five years. And it stems down to Ivan, and then Ivan does it with his his cultural, um, what he'd like over there. And um, I think we've just got the, the, perfect, the perfect scenario there now. If we don't change, um, we could be there for a while. Brian, so when it comes down to your position as CEO... Uh... How do you how do you approach it? Do you do you do you look at it as your job is to be honest and transparent with your with your shareholders, which are your fans and your sponsors and everything else? And I mean, you know, I, I deal with a lot of CEOs, deal with a lot of admin people in sport, and there's a lot of smoke and mirrors going on, especially in New Zealand around our rugby and things like that. How do you look at it? So when you face you know something that is awkward and sticky, like the Nathan situation when he gets that ban, I mean, how do you how do you personally look at it? Do you think okay, I just got a front, I got to be honest here, or do you or do you go through your communications, your PR? What's your own personal personal way of doing things? Look, my mother always told me, if you tell the truth, you'll never get into trouble. And I've stuck by that line all my life. And uh, I've never had a drama with it. And uh, we, uh, we've we had some sticky situations over the last four years there. And uh, we're uh, in front of the boys and um, I've been truthful with them and they've been truthful with me. We get over a little sticky problem that we've got. And um, I, I think it's taking no shortcuts as well. And I'm lucky at my 
age of life on sort of uh, an older secretary uh, or general manager compared to a lot of the younger people. And I was never there striving to win a comp overnight. And uh, it had to be through development. That's how we won our previous ones in 91 and 2003. Yeah, yep, remember. So it was in no, in no rush. And um, so um, I'm, I'm financially... Uh, sort of stable in my life so I don't have to take any shortcuts off the field for myself or anything like that and if you feed that back into the players and so forth and I'm a great believer in getting all these young players every second year that would say the ones that are on 300,000 plus they must buy a unit every every second year and have somebody else pay them pay it off for them so then when they retire in 10 years time they've got something mm. and, uh, and that's been my motivation with them and, and they appreciate that as well a couple of quick questions. We'll let you go. Brian Fletcher, CEO of the Pandas, and last night clinching the minor premiership, second time in three years. How important is it, and this is an obvious question, is your club to the community? Because for people who don't actually realise, Penrith is right at the foot of the Blue Mountains here, so it's quite away from Sydney, even though it's you know considered one of the Sydney clubs. But it is its own. Penrith is its own. It's almost like its own village, its own its own city within a city. So how important is your club to, to Penrith? Oh, look, Martin, it's... Terribly important. Um, uh, it's just the 300,000 people live in the Penrith city, and uh, it's just that that's their life. It's rugby league, and uh, the last three years they've been enjoying success. And um, I noticed the other night against Melbourne when we were, when we were behind, like <laughs> they couldn't believe what was happening. It was all silent, sort of thing. And um, it just it is for the for the district itself and, um, you know, all the economic benefits we get out of it as well. It's just it's just so good. And um, I've been there on the board years ago when we were running 15th and 14th and 13th and so forth. And that we get 5,000 people to the football. Now we average a crowd of 18,000, which is capacity right. no matter who we play. So it, it's enormously. And we've got a big club across the road and it, it makes a big difference to that organisation as well. Finally, you get asked this a bit. I mean, as soon as I say, hey, Brian Fletcher's on the program, everyone goes, brilliant, Fletch and Hindy. No, not <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I get a few phone calls and, and call that, yeah, but he, he's a wealthy Fletcher. I'm the battler. Congratulations again, and thanks so much for spending so much time with us. A pleasure, Martin.